I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back. I'm uh, into the hat trick mode here. Third one in a row, two days in a row. Tomorrow I'll try it one more time, but I'm excited to and always excited to invite somebody new to uh, the Investing Summit. Of course, people like Daniel DiMartino Booth are probably going to be here every time. Um, but uh, Dan Holland, our process, so Dan Holland, who's head of our media business, he finds uh, he finds the most interesting people. So uh, I was quite excited when, when I got to uh, read uh, my pack, like all the prep notes or, or whatnot, uh, on Matt Cole. So welcome, appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, thanks for having me. It's the <laughs> first thing that I noticed, it's like this institutional investor, like I mean, the notes are the notes, but I yeah. mean, it's like, sometimes I read them, sometimes I don't, but it's mm -hmm. like, CalPERS portfolio manager joins Strive Asset Management, the anti-woke firm backed by Peter Thiel and Bill Ackman. Uh, what, a, what a title. <laughs> it's, not, it's not from The Onion, it's true. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you guys get called anti-ESG, anti, I, get, I didn't know about the anti-woke thing. I mean, people will say anything in this day and age, especially if you're associated with somebody people have feelings about. Yeah, and, and uh, that's what the media does, right? They'll, they'll put a label on you and we actually reject those labels. So yeah. what, are, what are we doing? What are, what are we for? Why did I leave CalPERS, California, where I grew up my entire life, had never lived outside of the beautiful state of California never. until last really? May? Um, it all stems back to an easy question. And what is the purpose of a corporation? What is the purpose of a for-profit corporation? Mm -hmm. My belief is that it's to maximize value, period. It's not to be woke, it's not to be anti-woke, it's to make money. Mm -hmm. And I think that in this industry, we've moved away from that. Not everyone, you guys clearly have not moved away from that, but the impact that I've seen from, I'll call it the corporate ESG movement, is a rejection of American capitalism. Mm. I saw that at, at CalPERS, I was there for 16 years, and I joined in 2006. The first thing that I saw that happened there was that they had just been forced to divest from tobacco stocks. And it was interesting because I was- Forced by who? Forced by the board. What? The board set a policy that they had to divest from tobacco stocks. So what happened was the investment staff was recommending against it that this will be a constraint. Portfolio theory says that if you do any constraint in the portfolio that it's gonna limit your ability to optimize risk and return. Recommended against it, the staff recommended against it, the board, that is majority appointed by the governor, so majority appointed by politicians that have no investment experience, didn't care, and so there's this public fight. Mm. Public fight. What do you think happens when you're publicly debating if you're going to sell a massive position of, of stocks? It went down. Yeah. Uh, they sold the bottom. It ended up costing them $4 billion. And so my first experience there was that investing is political, but also that my coworkers were on the right side. They were recommending against it, and it got forced. A constraint got forced on them, and then through 16 years there, started to see the rise of ESG, having to fill out 500-page forms for the U United Nations PRI, UN PRI about all the the good that we're doing in the world, and it became more and more of a constraint on. My ability. I was a fixed income portfolio manager, and it's like, okay, like, really? It's, okay, like <laughs> the the constraint on me was I had to look at every single ESG or green bond that I possibly could, and so I literally looked at thousands of them there. I bet. You know how many I bought? Zero, and not because I was anti ESG. I was trying to make money, mm -hmm. and every single time I saw an ESG or green bond traded at a higher price, tighter spread than the non-green bond, even if it had the exact same credit risk. And so I would just put it in writing and say, hey, to, to my boss, hey, this is gonna cost us money unless I can find a greater fool to buy it at an even higher price. <laughs> that's like, like if that's the trade, yeah. like if, if we think that we're early, like maybe, but we're supposed to be long-term investors. We're supposed to look at these on a risk-adjusted basis, on a default basis, and find attractive opportunities, not try to find a greater fool trade opportunity. So, Anyways, big time waste to look at thousands of bonds. And after I'd seen a hundred of them, I kind of knew, but it was look at every single one, please try to find one, try to find one. Well, some other people I think saw a career opportunity. Mm -hmm. I buy green bonds, I, it's gonna be good for my career. 
And that's where I think you started to see some, some fractions there. And I think we've seen them across this entire industry of trying to make money while, while you're doing good. But I just see it as a constraint. And I see this nation pension fund specifically as having a crisis, a retirement crisis, an underfunded crisis. And we don't, we, we don't have time. I know Jim Bianco yesterday said, we're asking the stock market to be too many things. <laughs> you, can't, you can't be you know, ESG, do good, make money, solve the retirement crisis, solve the debt funding. You can't do all that stuff. You've, it's hard enough to have a profitable business that makes money, and mm -hmm. that's what we need to focus on. Yeah, that's, I, I commend you, man. I mean, it's, it you. sounds like that comes from your roots. Like you said it you know, briefly, but you're, you're, you're born and raised in California, but your, your parents did what? They were, they were in law enforcement, so both of them worked in corrections. They had their pensions tied to CalPERS. So I go to school, and I personally know we're an hour away from New York, not a fan of New York, didn't want to go to Wall Street. So for me, there was a great purpose in going to CalPERS and trying yeah. to help fix this problem. Well, I was there for 16 years. The funds I managed outperformed their benchmark every single year, but it was like picking up pennies in front of a steamroller mm -hmm. that we're focusing on all these other things than making money. Yeah, it's, it's great. You know, it's like um, we have a shared experience in that regard because my father's a 38-year you know, firefighter, retired. Um, my mom was a teacher. So they're both pensions, right? Mm -hmm. um, Canadian pensions, but, you know, like I'm, you know, we're well aware of the Canadian pension funds. We do business with them. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't mind me saying. Um, but the altruism in trying to help our parents and then seeing how they're getting, you know, their, everything they worked. When you, when you are in law enforcement, when you're the son of, of, of a cop or a law enforcement official at any level or a firefighter, you're, 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 and that's your dad, you, that's a grind. Your life's a grind, that's a grind. Mm -hmm. So for, they worked their whole life to get to that, to yeah. that pension. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, just it's, 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 it's much more disgusting for you and I to, yes. <laughs> you know, to really feel it. Don't make this about... ESG or, or, or woke. I mean, I don't think I've ever even used the word woke m making a decision. It's like do what's right. Yeah, yeah and, and, and my view is that we have a nation that, forget politics, we're just a divided nation. Yeah. And so whether, you, and I could look at some of the, I'll call it woke stuff or whatever the ESG stuff and say, I don't think maybe it's even good. We could debate that. I think that's debatable. But what we're doing at Strive is not to say, those are bad values, let's do the opposite values. It's no. We could debate values all day in this country that the purpose of an asset manager is to focus on value, mm. value maximization. Yep. And that's what pension funds should do, that's what asset managers should do, and that actually is a, is a depoliticized message that we could have people, you could have people in this room that are left-leaning, right-leaning, atheist, Christian, doesn't matter, that you have a shared purpose around a mission to tell stories, to show people what is attractive and make better investment decisions. Mm -hmm. That you could come together for that. that. That's actually a beautiful thing, and we shouldn't be woke or anti-woke. Make money. Yeah, I mean, we have, I mean, we have, like I said, we have clients that span the globe in all asset classes. I've never gotten into a discussion about woke. Well, now, ESG I've gotten into plenty of discussions about. Like how people will say how destructive that's been for um, you know, energy infrastructure, how destructive the, you know, and inflationary that, that that policy became. Now, those conversations happen. So mm -hmm. on, let's just, I don't even, we're not talking woke. Yeah. The ESG is a real thing that's created a lot of imbalances. Like you said, I'm assuming that these green bonds are bid up because enough people are paid to believe, mm -hmm. so there's a premium in that. Yeah. So they flow, you know, the mm -hmm. money flows and you're like, no, I'm not going to do that with my, with my parents' retirement money. Are you out of your mind? Yeah. <laughs> so ESG, can you talk a little bit about how you think about that? Because we have mm -hmm. clients that are really um, um, and empirically focused on this as an opportunity, like being yep. long energy, just to, or mm -hmm. uranium or, yep. you know, something like that. And, and we, we love those trades and we can get into that later. <laughs> so when we, to frame ESG, I'm going to go, I'm actually going to, start by taking it upstream and then take it back downstream. Okay. And so there's obviously been a huge debate in this industry, ESG versus anti-ESG. It's you, you write an article on it and it's the top top red headline and I think that's part of the reason why Strive's Is it? I don't oh, even oh, pay yeah, attention yeah. to it. Yeah, really. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating. Wow. Anytime Strive's mentioned it's just click 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 because 
will be labeled the anti-ESG firm. And, and we actually push back against that. And the reason is, is that an asset manager should consider every risk, including environmental risk, social risk, governance risk. Our differentiator is actually governance, that we think that proxy voting, engaging with companies, can materially impact the direction of that company, for better or for worse, that the owners of a company can change the direction of the company. I think that's not something that's debated. And that's G. So like we care a lot about G. We talk about G risk with regards to China a lot, that we actually view China as uninvestable to an American investor for governance reasons. But the actual debate that needs to be had is the one upstream, the mm -hmm. what is the purpose of a corporation? Are we, are we as a society going to keep American capitalism, which is shareholder capitalism, that the most important stakeholder is the shareholder? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that still true or are we rejecting that? And, and the large asset managers today are all rejecting that. They're, they're signing statements of rejecting it, calling it outdated, that today that you need to keep put the shareholder on equal footing as all the other stakeholders, the customers, the employees, the local communities, the governments. Our view is that all those stakeholders matter. You need to have satisfied customers at an, at, at an organization. You need to have satisfied employees. You need to retain your good employees. But you need to do those to maximize value to the shareholder. And that you can't serve multiple masters. You have to pick the most important sh uh, stakeholder, which we believe is the shareholder, period. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is the debate. And so if you take the Strive view and you say, okay, shareholder capitalism, American capitalism is worth defending, that incentives matter, there's a reason why more technological innovation happens in America than any other country, <laughs> and it's largely incentives. Then when you go downstream of that, you could say, okay, I've already said what I believe the purpose of a corporation is. How do I view E-risk, S-risk, and G-risk? Mm -hmm. And then to take it just one step further, what's happened in what I call the corporate ESG movement is there a singular way to look at ESG risk. Mm -hmm. And if you think about any other risk factor, if you and I start talking about recession risk or inflation risk, we might agree we'll probably have some differences in opinion. Mm -hmm. Why is it that with ES and G risk, there's only one way to look at it? And if you look at it in a different way, you're anti-looking at it. No, no. And I actually think if, and I talk about this a lot, criticizing the rights pushback, because I do think this has got political in a sense, the rights pushback to ESG, they've tried to outlaw considering those risk factors. Mm. And that makes no sense, that I can't consider governance risk when making investment decisions. Well, no, I should but I should do it to maximize value. Right. And, if I'm, and if, I, if I'm sacrificing value to the shareholder, specifically in like ETFs, without consent or even letting them know, that's a problem. And that's what we see happening in this industry, and that's what we're calling out. And that gets labeled anti-woke, anti-ESG. Well, that, that, I mean, for anybody who's um, compliant, um, that's a governance problem. Like, mm -hmm. if you're violating those rules as yes. a fiduciary, I mean, that's a, a major problem. It it is. It, it's, this, is it? I know you have to like you have to market and message your brand just like I do. Yeah. Um, but isn't it borderline like insulting that you have to defend American capitalism? And it's just like a if I'm sitting talking if if you're Warren Buffett back when he was your age, mm -hmm. and and then he was saying it, it'd be fine. Like this, this yeah. is kind of like like it's almost like the most ridiculous. Thing. Like I there's no counterpoints for me to make. So, so Warren Buffett's actually been a big proponent of shareholder capitalism, American capitalism, <laughs> yeah, no and, and and he's also someone that's <laughs> actually that, yeah, yeah, he's that, the, the, well, the greatest of all time. The he's goat. the greatest of all time. <laughs> and what I think is interesting because we get called you know, like right leaning firm, but like Warren Buffett's actually a left leaning individual that loves American capitalism and has killed it in his yeah. career. Right. Um, what I think has happened here is. It, we shouldn't even have to exist. Strive should not be a company that has to be differentiated to say American capitalism is great. But, what, <laughs> but what's happened is the rise of the index fund, right? The passive yes. index fund. That the largest shareholder of effectively every single company in the S&P 500 is the combination of BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, and Invesco. Mm -hmm. And that they're passive holders, they're not active, actively managed funds. And so there's not an incentive for them to earn an extra 1% in the S&P 500, they actually get pushed by the 
blue leaning pensions, mm -hmm. CalPERS of the world, yep. and, and not through the index fund actually, it's through products like the Aladdin product. Um, that, that is a huge contract for every single large pension. Uh, State Street's the custodian for all these large pensions. That they, they team up, they, they bring them in for meetings about how you can do better for the world and you know, make money doing it, and then they use these index funds to be the change agent for that, and, and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a major, it's ma with every major problem that I've seen in a quarter century of being on the street, there's the opportunity, right? I mean, mm -hmm. passive ETFs, that's one topic. Active ETFs, that's a huge opportunity, and I know we'll get into that because you have some, uh, which I'm really interested in, which is how, <laughs> how we start like investing or making money on this, but yeah. you know, the solution is you know, there's a better way, mm -hmm. and I don't like, I mean, I guess when you get the, the last thing on being labeled, I mean, you're going to yeah. get, if you're, if you have Peter Thiel and Vivek beside your name, you're, mm -hmm. you're going to, you're not going to be labeled left like Warren Buffett. Yeah. Right. So that's like, that's got to be annoying too. Mm -hmm. I mean, most yeah. asset management firms, uh, never mind asset management firms. You, any, yeah. Well, I just put the whole industry. It's not like when Steve Schwartzman goes and buys a hospital and cuts the cost that it says it's got a big S on the door, like you wanted to have at Yale and eventually got it on a building. But it's like, it's, yeah. like, it's not like it says, you know, Schwartzman's here, they're taking over. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even say, it doesn't even say Blackstone. Yeah. Right. But you guys, you, you know, you're putting your name on it. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're saying, I, I don't agree with this. Yeah. This is who we are, but you're automatically going to be considered right. So does that make, like, is that a problem? I, I don't think that. that it, it's not. And, and so the way I think about it is, you know, I go on all these debate panels all over the world, Berkeley University, that are, are left-leaning arenas, and I tend to find about two-thirds of people end up agreeing with us. They come in with a bias of what they think we're going to say, right. and then when they actually hear it, they're like, okay, like, I might really care about these E or S issues, but you're not saying the opposite. You're saying, like, you, we could say, okay, like, we're going to focus on the right-leaning issues. You're saying just make money and that, that, and, yeah. and, and that you actually can bring people together through that. And so, yes, you mentioned Peter Thiel. You mentioned Vivek. Well, Bill Ackman's typically been someone that's considered left-leaning, although I, 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 don't, I don't know, you know, every day I feel like, well, who cares? But who like, cares? But, like, my point being is that you have people like that. You, Warren Buffett's not an investor of Strive, but our views are very aligned with how he thinks about the world mm -hmm. and how he thinks about capitalism that lab labels don't matter. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, when you start telling the story and you, and you get out of the media bubble of how they want to label you, well, I, could, I could label <laughs> BlackRock because they literally signed to support European stakeholder capitalism and have called American capitalism outdated. I could say they're anti-American capitalism asset manager BlackRock. Never labeled that. And you that know, it, I, I've not seen that label. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've, never, I've never seen that label, but it, <laughs> I but mean, you could. But, I mean, but they, it, they, they've actually said that. I, that's it's it's, um, and on that two thirds ratio, by the way, that's that's pretty much where America's at because a third of people are socialists at least mm -hmm. now, yeah. right? I mean, they, they actually. I mean, this is. I don't know what the percentage is, but a high and rising percentage of the population, in particular, if they need handouts, mm -hmm. you know, and this is what you got. This is part of the fourth turning. Um, yes. So I just say like. If you want to be a, if you want to, if you need to go invest with the socialists, go do it. See how that works out for you. Yeah. And <laughs> there's this thing called American capitalism. And if you want to do that, which by the way, I take great pride as a Canadian. To, the number one thing that I'd say before s saying that I have great pride in having an American family, like mm -hmm. my wife and my four kids, raising them in this awesome country, is that when I came here, I had an opportunity to be as good as I wanted to be through meritocracy. American capitalism, way better than Canadian non-capitalism. That's why I came here, yes. right? Love that, right? That is, so I'll go to my grave with that. I don't care if people like, we won't have subscribers who cancel Hedgeye on that. No, no that's, that's, not, that's not the way that it is. So I, I just like, I, if I were you, I mean, for me, at least in this conversation, I just as soon as get on with it, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you, you guys have anybody who enters, and I'm not saying I'm not going to, enters the arena of active ETFs, has a huge opportunity against those four <laughs> passive flowers. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that that, I mean, if there's one opportunity in asset management, it's got to be a top three right now. Yeah. And if you think about our ETFs, so we have 11 of them, nine of them are actually passive. Yeah. And, and I think it's interesting because I agree with you on, on the active side, 
But even on the passive side, what has happened at the highest level is you've had same risk, same return, and a race to the bottom on fees. Yep. And those have been the three factors that are determining who you allocate funds mm -hmm. to. There's a fourth factor, and it's what is the approach to corporate governance? Mm -hmm. And it matters. And, and so I think when, when we're talking to people, they're awakening to that. Actually, our competitors are awakening to that. They're trying to offer choice of proxy voting. It's actually kind of a false choice. It's basically choose your flavor of ESG, but they're, say, they're seeing from their clients, we don't just want you to blindly vote on our behalf. That, that we don't trust you to do that and that this actually matters to us. So I think that's a, that's a positive move in, for this industry, but I do agree with you that there's there's some active opportunities that pop well, up. It, it, there's plenty of opportunity in passive too. I mean, the, um, I mean, we have a bubble in a lot of things. I mean, the number of, we run it every night. Rooster runs it every single night, runs me all of our factor-based analysis, which is not dissimilar from instead of E, S, G, all factor exposures when you're making your analytical decisions, P, V, V, price, volume, volatility, mm -hmm. on every single ETF. Some of the squirrels I've seen, like that pop up on our screens, you know, because when the volume pops alongside the price into a bullish trend signal for me, I have to look at it. Mm -hmm. I open it up, I look what's inside it. Sometimes you want to puke. Mm -hmm. You know, other times you're like, wow, this is innovative and exciting. So we're there. like according to me. <laughs> yeah. So I think you're in a, you guys are in a really good spot, which is what I wanted to talk to you because, I mean, we, we, we run this, you know, we just launched a thing called Portfolio Solutions where essentially my PA, I call it the MOFO, the Mucker Family Office, mm -hmm. which is my long only account. I literally copy and paste whatever I do in it every day and I show it to our subscribers. So the components of that, first thing you're gonna notice, guys, you could show it from this morning, I put it in the early look, the long side of the book, um, or the long only, it's, you know, I can't wait to find more people like you so that I can have more potential ingredients inside of my cake. Every day I'm trying to bake my diversified cake, right? So there it is. I mean, there are things in there, like if you look at that, like who owns the anti-beta equity exposure? Nobody. I mean, it's like, you know, and that's why you know, it's been doing well lately. I mean, it's there, that's, I think, the opportunity. So that's what I really want to get into, um, yeah. especially in fixed income. So those are the two, I mean, because that's your background, right? Yes. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you beat the bench for every year? Yeah, every year. That's it's, awesome, it's, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's how you get the, the top job at this place. <laughs> I'll, 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 it's part skill, part luck. I think. Uh, no, 16 years. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's really good. Yeah. I mean, I just, I was um, citing Malcolm Jenkins' book uh, today, The mm -hmm. Defensive Back. I don't know if you'd. Remember, he's more New Orleans Saints, so yeah. probably, and, and, and the enemy, public enemy number one of the Niners. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and but, thirteen years as a D back in the in the NFL, you know mm -hmm. that doesn't just happen. Yeah, you know, constantly you have competition. I mean, this is sixteen years. That's 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 phenomenal. Um, so so one, like maybe just give us some like when you think about building a portfolio, like away from the these some of these more bullshit items. I mm -hmm. mean. Like when you think about portfolio construction and your process, like what, mm -hmm. what do you think differentiated you yeah. like to do that? Yeah, so, so when I was there, I think what differentiated, so we used the BlackRock Aladdin system, which is order management system, risk system, yep. and used by all these institutional managers, right? Mm -hmm. What I saw as the issue with that system is it, for fixed income is that it looked at one scenario, the spot scenario, that interest rates remained unchanged. We know that's not, Reality, yeah. right? Like, we all could have different opinions on where they're going. What is there a plug in that? I've never, yeah. I've never used it. Well, it it's, it's just a, it's just a. I mean, it's, it's, it becomes a huge data problem when you start expanding beyond one scenario. But I said, there's a million scenarios, right? Like, <laughs> and, and so, and so, this is a, this is a data problem. We were managing seventy billion dollars. The overall fixed income portfolio was like one hundred and thirty, but I was helping manage seventy billion dollars of it and then directly was managing the $70 billion of it when I became a portfolio manager, I said, we need to be able to look at every single different possible scenario, how our portfolio will perform, mm -hmm. how the index will perform. That was not something that it really existed in the industry. No one was looking at, at that many scenarios. So we, we created 17 different scenarios. Mm. It was bull steepeners, bull flatteners, bear steepeners, bear ste flatteners, different magnitudes. And, and, and then once you had all those scenarios, you could then start thinking about probabilities. What do we think is happening in the world? 
Um, you know, we used a, a mosaic theory, but then start to, to put on top of those what we thought was probabil the probabilities of each scenario, which then created a probability scenario weighted analysis. And then it also showed where we underperform. So you cannot construct a portfolio, or, or I'm not smart enough to construct a portfolio that outperforms in every single scenario. Maybe there's someone that is, not me. Yeah. Uh, but you typically in fixed income could outperform in about three quarters of scenarios if you constructed your portfolio well. So where are we gonna underperform? Let's make sure those are scenarios we're comfortable with. Let's make sure that we feel comfortable with the magnitude of underperformance if those scenarios were, were to play out. Yep. And then let's, you know, obviously the ones we think are most likely, let's try to position a portfolio that will do best there. And that was how we, how we thought about it, which was pretty revolutionary even versus the institutional tool of Aladdin. So mm -hmm. um, that was kind of the, the thing that I built on top that I think was the key to outperformance. And, and something that we still do to the to this day. So you that you'd call that proprietary, obviously, like <laughs> how you thought about that and looked at the system. Yeah. Um, right there with you. That's exactly how I think about it. I mean, I think about we call them the quads. Mm -hmm. So if I have I have my probable situation and I have the other outcomes. Yes. I didn't have 17. I got it down to four. Mm -hmm. And those economic environments, from a global macro perspective, give you higher probability asset allocations. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we're entering quad three stagflation, I don't want to be long high beta. I want yes. to be long anti-beta. You know, so this, I am still almost you know, shocked at some level, not surprised, but still shocked <laughs> that that's not common speak. You know, you got 60-40, mm -hmm. you got these flows into these big passive ball hoggers. Yes. Um, so that's a, that's a really, I mean, so, so when you take it to strive, I mean, you're thinking about it in terms of framework and foundation of these two, do you have two active? We have two, yeah. So we have a total return bond fund and then a ultra short enhanced income fund. So you so, get so, to compete with the real ball hogger, the BND or what is yeah. it, no ag? So, 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 so we're, we're actively managed, so ag, we are, but the total return fund is benchmarked versus the ag. So just like the, the PIMCO total return bond fund, double line, you know, all these, all these different total return bond funds. And so that one has a duration around six. So mm -hmm. we're thinking about what are the risks that you can take in a fixed income total return bond fund there's four macro risks, duration, credit, liquidity, and convexity. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have a pretty contrarian bet versus the market there where basically we're flat duration, we're flat credit risk, although we have some selection differences versus the index, but flat overall credit risk. I view us generally at the end of a business cycle mm -hmm. where I don't think credit, and, and credit risk, by the way, credit spreads are basically average to their long-term average or slightly below average. So don't really love taking uh, cre credit risk. I view duration similar, I think, to you and Jim as four and a half is kind of like a fair level. So mm -hmm. don't really want to take a big duration risk bet right now. Liquidity risk in an ETF, that's just a laughable proposition ever. <laughs> so uh, you know, we're, we're not going to be taking liquidity risk when we write a pension. That's a little yeah. different. You know, take a little liquidity risk at a pension. Uh, convexity risk, though, is, is really interesting. and That's the one that everyone that's listening that doesn't do bonds, uh, they don't know what that means. Yeah, so what is it? Volatility. And if you were to look What's at... That? Volatility. I, I know you, you guys... You should pay attention yeah, yeah, to volatility. You should pay attention to volatility. <laughs> I know you guys have the, the Simplify guys on sometime. yeah. uh, sometimes. Sometimes, uh, so, so Harley Bassman actually created a volatility index for bonds called yep. the Move Index. Guys, you can show it. Today I showed it, that sucker's howling right that now. That sucker is howling. <laughs> and, and, and so it's very high right now. And the VIX is not nearly at levels like the Move Index. Look at that thing going back. That goes way back yeah, too. Yeah, it looks like it maybe goes back. Does it go back to 08 or is that 2020? When the spike on the, on the left, I can't, I can't see. That is uh, 2020. 2020. Oh, 2020. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Basically, it's at, it's at crisis levels. And if you were to take it back further, it's basically at levels that you see during <laughs> crises. Because we're in one. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I believe the, the one standard deviation move right now for the 10 years is like 10 basis points. Really high. And so we are taking a short position on bond volatility. Oh, really? And Good. so how we're doing that is actually through agency mortgage-backed securities. And so if, you're, if your audience is, is not familiar, there, there's an embedded option in mortgages, you buy a mortgage as an investor, you're long the bond, and you're short the borrower's ability to refinance it or sell their home whenever they want. Mm -hmm. That is an option that is owned by the home buyer. Mm -hmm. 
well, we are taking a lot of those options. We, we, are, we are buying mortgages. We are, we are basically not bullish on refinancing spiking in the near future. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you're getting paid very handsomely to take that risk. Mm -hmm. Actually getting about 40 basis points more in spread than taking investment grade credit risk. Wow. And so I look at it as like for myself, I say, okay, what's my view on the tenure? And I think four and a half is about a, a fair rate. Maybe we work into like a three to 6% range is kind of the range that I, that I see coming out over the next few years. If that's the case, even if we were to rally down to 3%, these mortgage bonds we're buying, refinances will not spike. Mm. You would really need basically us to go back to ZERP for the, the, these home buyers to, that, are, that are buying mortgages. Not today, right now mortgage rates are like 8%, but the ones that we've been buying have mortgage rates around 6%. If it's, anything, that's where, I mean, a, a move lower in rates, I mean, people need exit liquidity. I mean, BREIT needs exit liquidity. Yes. So you, it's like you're going to get, they're just all waiting for the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like you talk about liquidity yes. and not being an issue for you in, in the ETF, but that's, there are a whole bunch of things other than the thing about interest rates, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's why you look at it, assumingly on a, on a multi-factor basis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so, that, so what is the ticker for this ETF? STXT. STXT. The Strive Total Return Bond Fund. Now you got to be careful with this stuff because, um, or with me. Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, I think um, I've been called, uh, well, I get called a lot of things, but the, um, <laughs> on, so you know Nancy Davis? Uh, no. From Quadratic? I know of her, but I don't know her. So she, she'd probably call me a little dangerous on this, okay. right? Because, you know, like she has this, ET, actually I just bought some today. Um, Ivol is the ticker, not implied vol, but mm -hmm. Ivol is the, her, her ETF, which is essentially, and she, we debate back and forth, but if I want to be long a steepener, Mm -hmm. Whether it be a bull or bear steepener, yeah. I don't care. I'm going to mm -hmm. buy her ETF, and I've done it historically. So, we, <laughs> so I'm warning you: if, yes. I, if if Hedge Eye Nation buys, if this sucker hits, if this ticker hits the our asset allocation model, you can immediately see like the flow, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, so it's not. Um, and full disclosure, I we've never met. Yep, uh, never. That's the way I like to do it. I want to get a pure organic look on. Who I'm talking to, you know, would I be interested? What's the background? That's why we spend so much time, and I think that that's important when we have our first conversation. So we have that mm -hmm. foundation, so that yes. our community knows who you are. Yeah. Right. And then Absolutely. we can get into because we could have spent, and next time we'll spend probably 45 minutes talking about duration, convexity, liquidity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, really, kind of getting in, into that. But um, so that one, just, I just want to get. And what's the other uh, ETF you have? The the B active Bux, one. Bucks. B U X X. Oh, nice. Good, yeah. Good yeah so that one. We'll have a duration between 0 0.5 to 1. So just think of it as stable, should be moving up with, with some investment grade credit risk. So if you yeah. have a, a, an event like the COVID event, it would have had like other similar funds, yeah. a spike down and a widening of spreads. And then that's but, an easy one. But yeah. uh, the easiest thing, I mean, this is when I said passive is easy. I mean, like something like I own like T bill or T flow. Mm -hmm. I mean, why don't, why don't you launch those easy ones? I mean, that's the... We, we probably will. The, the idea for us is what is our differentiator? What are we, what are we good at? What are we calling out? So T-bills, I mean, theoretically, BlackRock's not doing anything wrong with T-bills. So it would be like, <laughs> hey, great, support Strive, but it's just a T-bill fund, right? So, so in, in equities, we are differentiating ourselves with corporate governance and in fixed income, ESG is actually a major issue in fixed income where 40% of bond managers are actually excluding different sectors. And so people, I think when, when we like first- Like energy. Yeah, energy. So, so yeah, <laughs> actually specifically energy, right? So I know you're bullish energy. I'm very bullish energy. As a firm, we're very bullish energy, but we're not, the, the bond funds on an anti-ESG fund. We have an overweight to energy because I think energy credit spreads are attractive, but we think the negative convexity trade is significantly more attractive. So we're just trying to make money. You know, it's, 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 it's amazing that you can actually be objective. Yeah. <laughs> and at the same, you know, on the, on the other hand, have people that are known politically. Yeah. I mean, I just finished reading Musk's book. I mean, very clearly, him and Thiel had a very good relationship. You know, the, the story about uh, the McLaren, you know, crashing was like, like it was kind of like epic. But, but it's, it's, it's like, you can be very bullish on energy. You can be Elon, obviously very bullish on EV, and you know you can still get along. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Yes, <laughs> totally fine. Um, where do you, where do you think, like so so STXT, mm -hmm. 
versus ag. Mm -hmm. Like I, Nancy Davis does this really well. She's like, okay, look, you know, it's BND and then there's BNDD. She has BNDD and she and there's B, everyone owns BND. Mm -hmm. um, like, is there a simple uh, difference between you know where you, what yours is going to be and what ag already is? The passive ag will be. Yeah, yeah. I think generally it has to be. Yeah, there is. So so we're going to be making. Rip, trades, right? So we're right. going to take sometimes duration risk, sometimes we're going to be taking credit risk, sometimes we're going to be taking negative convexity Good. risk. I think there's there's a maybe a bias of so most actively managed bond portfolio managers outperform over a market cycle. Mm -hmm. And if you ask a quant as to why, you get very very interesting answers and I think most a lot of quants that I that I know that I'm friends with would say, well, there's a systematic overweight to credit risk. And so, yeah, they outperform because they they take you know, 150 basis points over, and they just take a riskier portfolio, and you could just buy investment grade credit, and also likely over the long run outperform the ag that's 30% treasuries. Um, we're, that's not what we're doing in this fund. We're going to be doing different risk levers when we th yep. see different things as as attractive, which, which I think in and of itself differentiates differentiates itself that we don't even have an an overweight to credit risk in a bond fund that's trying to outperform the ag. Well, it's um, a, it's a, in and of itself, I mean, that's an, a, a big differentiator. And if, if I'm right, I mean, and we go from, and it happens like a heart attack. I mean, you mm -hmm. go from 400 over to 600 over in high yield spreads in a New York minute. And mm -hmm. if you are long credit because you're cheating or trying to catch, you know, to grab for that extra yield, this is actually the spot, as you well know, where those, you know, where it's back to, you know, you know kind of the, the example of, 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 of football. It's like, you're cheating. You're, you're, you're trying to pick off Brady and now he's going to take you deep. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, if, if at this particular point in the cycle. Yes. So on that, do you, do you actually have an economic outlook on the, uh, like minds that we're entering recession, we're going to be in one for the, by the first half of next year, be clear to anyone who doesn't have a view that, that we're already in one. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you ha yeah. feel like you have to have a view on that or do oh, you have? Oh, I, absolutely. And, okay. and my, my view is in alignment with you that we are at the end of a business cycle. The question is when we enter a recession, right. I mean, not, not if. I, I tend to think that it might be annoyingly delayed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it has been. <laughs> and it has been, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and I was on a, a, a Twitter spaces with Mike Green a couple of weeks ago, and we were kind of just going back and forth about, you know, he's like, it's coming, it's coming, I know it's coming. And I think that the economic data that I see is just a little bit stubborn, but what I see with the, the yield curve, with a lot of different just underlying things in the economy, is that the kindling is there for a recession, mm -hmm. and what's the match? And you might say the match is, is lit right now, and I think there's, there's several different things that I think could cause it in the near term, but my best guess is that it's a late 2024, early 2025 thing. But where I'm in alignment with you is I'm not taking credit risk because you might be right, and it might be in three months, or it might be entering it now, and it's not the time that you to, want to be loading up on that risk. Well, that, and people screw that up all the time. I mean, having no position is a position. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I learned that from Buffett himself. I mean, it's like, it's too bad, actually, that things like like capitalism uh, or, you know, don't lose money, mm -hmm. like start with not having a position yes. if it has the risks that you know are going to kill you. Mm -hmm. um, it's so bad that, like, what people, it's a cartoon, right, CNBC, but it's like what people think is investing. You'll hear, and I'm sure you have views on this, too, but an entire generations now, millennials, Gen X, homelanders, they think investing is just invest what you could afford to lose. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's, it doesn't start this way yeah. by eliminating the obvious risks. Mm -hmm. um, I guess in, if you're going to compete in fixed income with active ETFs, that's a huge competitive advantage. Yeah, yeah. it is. And you know, we've only, our fixed income funds have only been live for two months. Two months? We're, we're trying to okay. make money over, over a market cycle they're, I think they might be, the, the total return bond fund might be the best performing one, but it's too early to tell. But so far, that we have a contrarian bet on. I think it's, it's starting to play out with credit spreads starting to widen a little bit, and, and we don't have that position. We don't have either duration long position, which I think was pretty commonplace in a lot of the total Very return common. bond <laughs> funds. Uh, so we've, we've benefited from, from those. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll see if it continues. Well, I mean, and you don't, what I lo like about this, I almost said love, but I can't fall in love with any tickers. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the, the, the competition for you, the field is really part of 
you know, I call it the, the elites, the state and the elites. The elites don't like the way duration's going. Let's make some calls to make sure we get the Fed out there with some dovish commentary. I mean, we yeah. need to stop this. We just got our ass handed to us and we weren't supposed to. Mm -hmm. Powell was, Powell, we told Powell, don't, don't hike. He didn't hike. We, we thought that was a good spot to get long duration. Yeah. Like we know some pretty big bond managers that got long duration two jobs reports ago. Mm -hmm. And they're plugged in. Yeah. But you don't need to be. No. Do, you, do you loathe that? I mean, the way that you, you, you don't like being you know, labeled certain things? <laughs> you, know, you know, I I think you and I would agree a lot on kind of the Fed and what's going on there. My, my, my view is, you know, my job as an asset manager is don't, don't who cares what I, what I think should happen or what I right. wish would happen, what is gonna happen, right? And, yeah. and, and let's react to that. We don't, we don't, we don't need uh, the Fed to bail us out. I mean, my, my view on duration when we launched this fund was that I thought duration was gonna go higher, but I actually was thinking where I was wrong that maybe we could get a little bit better opportunity yeah. to go short duration. So we just started out neutral and bonds just sold off. So I slept good. That's good. I mean, because yeah. I mean, it sucks to, to be them, I think. Now. Yeah, absolutely. If your job is to try to jawbone the Fed into the position you have, mm -hmm. you know, that to me, it's, it's, it's again, it's like this is anti-American anti too. I just don't, mm -hmm. I know how we got there. Yeah. But I'd lo I love competing with that. Oh yeah, yeah I, you, you gotta I, love that. I, I I absolutely do. The uh, the hangover from QE is real. Yeah, it's a big deal. I mean, by the way, I was gonna show a chart that we should have shown in re in prior discussions. This is why, like, on the recession, or at least a big reason why Danielle and I were highlighting this slide one ten, guys. It shows the rate of change of government spending. I mean, this was like this inexorable force and force really to not have a recession. When you take the rate of change numbers on big G and the C plus I plus G equation for GDP like that, it's mathematically impossible to have a recession. Oh, you don't want to have jobs? Uh, you don't want to have jobs losses? You don't like that? Uh, because that would be a really bad thing if you're the president, like slide uh, 113. So government hiring, we call this a rocket. You know, that chart, by the way, Matt, go, does go all the way back to 2009. So it shows you that even Trump, you know, that makes Trump look like nothing in 20, you know, when he went for the tax cuts or anything incremental, um, this this has a, been a huge uh, force. I mean, it's a rocket chart, right? Elon would be proud of that chart too. So it's there, there yeah. yeah. But I, I just think, I mean, you, and just mathematically, you have to lap those government spending comps next year. So mm -hmm. that's one of the main reasons why, when we look at you know those four scenarios, mm -hmm. we're we're essentially saying, look, the probability rises of a faster slowdown because you have to lap those charts, right? So I, I guess it's my last question for you has to do with. Because when you're talking about credit risk, I'm pretty sure you're talking about the business cycle because you said it. Mm -hmm. um, what about sovereign credit risk? Like, how, how have you thought about that? I mean, we've never had to in our career, because we're you know not like we weren't investing in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. We haven't had to deal with that. Like, you never. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't even say that was credit risk, but that was like pervasive stagflation or chronic stagflation. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, we don't buy sovereign credit in our current portfolio, so it's all it's all U.S. based. So it's not a not a huge focus point on mine, but U.S. sovereign credit risk. Yeah. I meant. Oh, U.S. sovereign credit risk. Yeah, yeah. It's the thing that's never yeah, happened yeah, before. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think that at the end of the day, the Fed will make bonds money good unnaturally, and that that could have consequences for inflation, for the dollar. Yeah. It's it's money good, but is it money good? I yeah. mean, unnaturally, this is this is why. Like, it's interesting that wasn't a, like a Freudian slip, like yeah. there, where you thought like sovereign credit risk is has been for our whole career reserved for dysfunctional governments like Argentina. Mm -hmm. go, you know, we, can, we don't have to name them all. Yes. But Druckenmiller's view right now is that that's actually his big thing, right? He's mm -hmm. like, well, now U.S. sovereign credit risk is going to turn into Latin American or some dysfunctional mm -hmm. risk. I mean, yes. that. Like when bond yields go up, most people, including myself, are like, ah, okay, I hear you, Stan. I mean, he's one of the world's best macro investors. I think you should listen. Mm -hmm. But I can't really, I don't have a back test. Doesn't mean it's not happening. Yeah. But it's, it's something that somebody really serious who's really good believes. Mm -hmm. So like, how do you think about that? I think he's right. It's, we have a debt crisis in this country. And we also have a problem of who are going to be the natural buyers of U.S. Treasuries, yes, and it's somewhat shielded, I think, a little bit in this rise of yields because a lot of U.S. government debt is long duration, and so yeah, it's gone down in, in price. But if you're the U.S. government, like 
you're not the one that's that's hurting from that. It's the person that bought the debt, right? <laughs> uh, TL, TLT is down what 40 percent, but you know who cares? Uh, we should we should have done 100 year bonds when when you know interest rates were at zero, right? Uh, from as, from a government's perspective. But I do think it's a it's a longer term problem, and it's very to me it's very difficult to say when does it really light on fire. I mean, I think we're seeing signs of it with with yields going up. I I don't think yields go back down to the areas they were partially because of this. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, at, at the at the end of the day, it's they're 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 money good. So yeah, uh, well, it's it's a real I mean it's a real thing when they're not. Yeah, you know that's. Um, and I think, I think you're right. I think we just got our first taste of it. Mm-hmm. And you can't really, if you're multi-factor like you and I are, mm-hmm. it, it would take a, a gargantuan amount of arrogance to say that's per basis point, the move on, cre- on sovereign credit, US sovereign credit risk, mm-hmm. that's the inflation part, that's this next GDP number still being a good one because of the big G. It's, it's mathematically impossible, mm-hmm. which makes it dangerous. So that's why the moves figured that out. And mm-hmm. It's interesting. I like how you've thought about fading that because historically, you know, these things do have a mean reversion, obviously. So mm-hmm. that's cool. Well, uh, we're, we've, uh, they're giving me this sign over there. That means that uh, we've run out of time. So, awesome. you know, thanks for doing your first one with us. I'm sure we'll have you back. I, I, I appreciate And I appreciate, like, what you're doing just in standing tall. Like, again, I said it, it's kind of like, isn't it kind of pathetic that you have to defend American capitalism, but at least you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more people should be. Thanks. It was fun being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so that was Matt Cole. Nice introduction to uh, a new player in the Hedge community. I can't tell you, you know, what ETF we're going to buy or sell, but certainly uh, somebody who's thought about the current landscape and is applying his not only his experience but his his view of the way that it could and should be uh, to a place that's certainly going to need it. So thanks for today. We had a, another very good day. That's three in a row. Thanks for putting up with me. I appreciate it. I got one more day of you putting up with me, which is tomorrow, and we'd love to see you back. Thanks. <laughs>